So today we had a very interesting discussion in the, uh, our, we host a virtual Infium Salon every other Wednesday. So not every Wednesday we host this clubhouse discussion, but then every other Wednesday, we also have a Zoom session where we invite four presenters. Esther was one of them. And today we had two really interesting investors in the space. Um, one who's in, in the seed stage of the investment and one who's in the later stages of the investment, you know, investing in companies like uh, Coinbase and BlockFi and some of the largest um, ventures in the space. And their discussion about, you know, what's interesting in blockchain has just been, you know, kind of just really like poetry for my intellectual self. You know, it was just so much fun to see their kind of perspective on investing and all the opportunities that we're seeing. So Rich, since you also have that, you and, and Daniel have that investor hat on, I'd like to see what you guys thought about the discussion and what you may want to add to it. And, and specific to um, in on the investor hat, what what was the specific? Yeah, area? so they were they were basically saying that um, you know there's just so much technology to be developed that yeah. clearly blockchain is not the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. There, um, I would say Xavier from you know Morgan Creek Capital was saying that um, there is an opportunity to really um, you know kind of look at all the technologies that are emerging right now. Uh, emerging like AI and blockchain kind of emerging together. And I said, well, there's Superworld, that the company that basically has something new almost every week because there's some part of their technology that's kind of moving forward. So maybe you can address kind of living inside that coordinate system, what that feels like. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think that's a really great point, Mariana, that, you know, it's hard to assess um, as we are kind of experiencing a conversion and, you know, really a rapid growth and advancement of, uh, of technologies, all of them, even specifically blockchain or AR, VR, or AI. Um, and as they come together, you know, at Superworld, we're, uh, you know, again, a virtual world that incorporates all of these technologies and, you know, as we are thinking about the best ways to incorporate them, you know, I think our, our focus is, is really trying to figure out what, what do customers want to achieve? Like, what is, what is their problem that we're trying to solve? And, and how, do they, how do we add value to their real lives? And, you know, sometimes uh, blockchain is the answer. Sometimes, you know, kind of progression to decentralization is a better answer. Um, you know, I think you see that uh, on the blockchain space, you know, when you look at like the flow ecosystem versus the e Ethereum ecosystem and gas fees or, you know, some in terms of the speed and numbers of transactions that can can be done. And, and you know, and, and but then a longer term, you know, is 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 one more decentralized versus the other. So there's a lot of things to weigh, um, you know, depending on the technology you're looking at. Um, I could say the same thing for the AR, VR space or, or you know, things that we're looking at in terms of AI. So, um, you know, I think ultimately it's I think the way we approach it, especially on the as we talk to investors or think about investing ourselves into certain areas, I think it's really about what is going to be, uh, you know, what what is our customers uh want what is that going to mean on the short term for them in the long term i think we're very long term focused as a company and i think it's it's a good idea to look at these technologies um in a longer term fashion um you know i just think about how you know three years ago when we got into nfts you know it, it was hard to explain that but we knew that over time people would get it and you know it's 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 surprising how quickly that's happened so you know i think the same thing will happen across these other technologies yeah, and then the second thing I think they talked about was this idea that we really are at the beginning of the cycle of development in the blockchain space. And even though it seems that almost everyone is in, in the NFT business right now, or almost everyone is working on a DeFi project, or almost everyone is issuing a token, this is still a very nascent space. So maybe, Scott, you want to kind of comment on what your views are on this? Huh. But what's interesting about this space is being so, I, I guess, nascent or immature or still finding their way, depending on how you look at it, is 
uh, when you when you look at what each of them is doing, some are copycats, others are trying a new version of it or, or a new shtick on it or, you know, however you want to look at it, maybe focusing on a different type of community, a different type of collectible applied to a different kind of use case. Right now we're in the point where I think that we're just trying to find which use case sticks, which one people want to adopt the method that they want to utilize it. And, and we are so far away from being able to consume a lot of this technology in everyday life uh, that, that we have a ways to go. Um, what's really nice to see, especially over the last six months is the amount of investment pouring into the founders and the projects so that we have an opportunity to see which tech will survive. Uh, and I think it will actually be a, a, a battle of the best, not just who can spend the most marketing dollars, which as a technologist, you know, I, I would like the best pattern to win, uh, not just the one that spent the most money getting eyeballs on it, because that's a security problem waiting to happen when, when you apply my lens to it. And, and I really liked the analogy, you know, during the, the salon where they said, you know, sometimes the difference between these platforms or chains is like you copied a game that somebody's playing and you just changed one tiny little thing. But that one tiny little thing is enough to get people to switch and play your game instead of that old game. And that actually resonates with me because I do that when I play games. You know, oh, I like that one better and I completely stop. It's tricky though, because people get stuck in an ecosystem. They have their investment there, they have their art there, they have their NFT there, pick, pick a thing they have there. Um, we have no transportability yet, no cross-chain cloning, right? We, we still haven't figured out the real problems, first of all, or if people care. You know, what if I were to build something in Superworld and want to transport it into my Minecraft world? Like, is that a thing that should be okay? Can, can I copy because I own it? Can I clone it into Minecraft land? Is that fixed in Superworld? Is it, you know, stuck there? Can I can I take an Ethereum NFT and remint it on Solana or Binance Chain and have it still be the same thing? These are real world problems we're going to have to overcome here pretty soon. And I think they're legal ones, not technical ones. Well, that's why we have Esther. She's going to solve these problems. Actually, I was talking to her about this particular topic, Scott, yesterday. Uh, so I'm going to have her comment on some of the things that she's noticing with some of the NFT marketplaces, not no portability of your NFTs per se. So Esther, you want to talk a little bit about how this could be solved? Yes. Um, uh, no, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, this is something that's like really near and dear to my heart because as a, you know, fine art photographer, you know, you know, I've, uh, you know, have some of my work um, in a number of collections and, and the NFT space is something that got really interested in, um, in the very early days. But at the end of the day, it's like, if I have a collector buying my NFT, what rights are actually being conferred to them? And so, um, you know, this is something that over at Monax, we were like, well, we have this really great, um, you know, CLM solution. Why don't we just go ahead and bring in sort of these traditional uh, uh, tools, uh, you know, a, a legal agreement and link it, immutably link it to the NFT. And it could be something really basic, but at least now you can really outline the rights that are conferred uh, to the buyer of the NFT. And, you know, it could be something as, you know, you have full commercial rights to this NFT um, or, or, you know, it's a licensing NFT. You know, you can only use it for a year and after that year, you know, it expires. Um, and so we would be able to, to, to track and, and make that happen. Um, but it is an area, it is, you know, very early. And I think it's just really important for people to understand, like, what exactly are you buying at the end of the day? you know, besides just a key that's been hashed. And also, I think we had this discussion about an open NFT marketplace and a closed NFT marketplace and the difference, you know, kind of in ownership there. Yeah. Um, yeah. These marketplaces, like they all have, you know, different, uh, you know, flavors to them. And I would say like the walled garden approach uh, is one where uh, it, it, it's like you are, you know, 
protected in the case because you know you're, you're reselling within that secondary market but the moment you take that token somewhere else um off chain uh, and there's a transaction that's done off chain how do you ensure that those royalties are actually being honored um and and given back to the creator so for right now you know we're very um we would love to have this open market type of uh landscape but from a legal perspective um and from a regulatory perspective it, it's you know we're sort of operating within a, a closed market approach um you know until there's protocols um around uh you know the, the aml kyc that can really go beyond uh centralized or closed market uh, platforms. So can I can I ask you a, maybe a, I don't know if this is a opinion question, but do you as a creator care where it ends up? Do, do you care who buys it? Um, like where, where's your like yeah. personal belief versus what's legal and regulated? There? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, that's a great one. I mean, for for me as like a creator, you know, I definitely don't want my NFT in the hands of of a terrorist, right? Uh, and so I I just have no idea once it's out there in the world, how do you ensure that doesn't happen? Um, and and so I would probably favor these more you know sort of closed marketplaces initially until we're able to uh, you know track that and have some enforceability there. That's interesting. And yeah. then when you when you mint an NFT. If I were to, um, I, I made up this use case earlier today, you know, I'm moving it from Scott chain to Esther chain and you minted it on Esther chain and I wanted it on Scott chain. So I burned it on yours and reminted it on mine. Is that the same NFT or not? I would say it's a new NFT. It's like you're, you're issuing a new stock, right? Yeah, kind of. Um, but what if there was a third chain, you know, Harish chain that could track that I burned it and reminted it? Like then, is yeah. it the same because I have provenance? Well, I would say that it all comes down to how you structure it to begin with, right? If, <laughs> if you, if it comes out of the, the the issuance, and I think that's why we're so early. Like it's such the early days because yeah. people aren't really thinking about the the long term impact of, of what's going to happen with that asset once it's minted. Yeah, I had yeah. this conversation about a expensive piece of art with somebody the other day, a physical piece of art, you know, a real old mm -hmm. one. And when you when you look at that kind of art where it has been, who was the previous owner, how it has been treated, has it been displayed, it is almost as important as who created that piece of art. Um, mm -hmm. Because because it's the posterity of it. Yes. And we haven't quite figured that out in this market because, you know, Address 7 owned it before me. Who, who's Address mm -hmm. 7? I don't know. Maybe it's Mariana. And that's cool that she owned it. You know, maybe it would have more value if I knew. She, she owned it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this is why like galleries, you know, you know, as, as much as we're, you know, we're trying to sort of make this as frictionless as possible and remove some of those intermediaries, you know, they're there really to oversee like, you know, the work as it exchanges hands um, and ensuring, you know, is this, you know, piece, you know, not going to get burned or, or, you know, it's sort of trying to remove some of the bad actors in the place. But now, you know, with, with us sort of going independent and this more of like creator economy, you're, you're out in the wild, wild west. And um, I think we just need more education in this space. So people really think about, okay, if I do this, what what are the what ifs? And maybe you don't care. Maybe you're, it's a piece that you're like, well, it's not that near and dear to my heart. It's okay. I just want to experiment. And it's you know great if you want to experiment. But when you start talking about high value assets, that's when you really got to think about long term, what could potentially happen with it. Trish, you had a question? Hi, I didn't have a question. I just popped up. Hi, Esther. I'm a photographer too, and I'm still new and learning in this space. But the way I, I mean, I kind of think sometimes the conversation about like rights and copyright and everything is same as in the real world. Like people right click off of sites and I know like there's resolution, mm -hmm. but it is so easy even on the gated sites to download high, high resolution files from um, IPFS. It's been, in fact, foundation put a link up a while ago and immediately took it down that said download because they, they want people to see it on, I, I always get my acronym, I have to think about it, IPFS. And so it's, it's kind of the same problem. The way I understand it is that generally speaking, the purchaser of the NFT does not have any rights other than ownership of that, the same as if they owned a print. 
and um, and less explicitly stated. Like I actually think there's a, there's a really great possibility for stock photographers in this space, which I haven't mm -hmm. really seen yet. But I don't. I just am not sort of like catching the issues, the burning for sure. That's something I, I haven't really learned much about. But um, you know, issues of you know that aren't already sort of existing in the real world, and especially I don't see. I wish I did, but I'm not seeing a big difference as far as like safety of artwork. Like your your work is safer on Nifty Gateway than it is on OpenSea. I, I I definitely don't don't see that. Right. Yeah. I, I guess at the end of the day, like if you have you know some type of legal terms injected into the token, at least it provides you with some guardrails to have some type of legal recourse at the end of the day. Where um, and. Yes, you know, you know, people can, you know, right click on an image, you know, anytime anything goes online, there's a, you know, huge prevalence for fraud. But at the end of the day, like that original, you know, asset, you know, that has, you know, that owner of that particular NFT, um, you know, there's only one. Um, and so if, if, if fraud is happening, there is a way, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but, you know, you do have these third parties that go around to see whether something, uh, you know, is, is being fraudulently used or not. And that's where as a creator, if you, if you do, uh, you know, uh, work with some of these enforcers, you could say, well, here's, here's a dossier of, of, of the evidence of how it's been tracked, uh, you know, over, over the life of, 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 you know, the sales over time. And um, I think it just provides you with legal recourse in, in that case. Because what if the piece ends up uh, being copied and then printed on T-shirts or, you know, and this happens in real world uh, where, where folks work is being used commercially without their approval. So I think just having at least some legal assurances around it, I think is, is better than not having anything. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I, 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 I do say like, I still think the threat of reproduction and copying is greater right now on um, IPFS than it is on websites because website images, right, are usually lower resolution. I just mm -hmm. like imagine, you know, like fact, like print houses on Alibaba, just downloading the shit out of some really beautiful work and reprinting because I've seen them do it, you know, with work, you know, off of Etsy for crying out loud. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a treasure trove for bad actors, but at least the there's a record, right, of who mm -hmm. purchased it, but finding those, the people, it's, you know, rarely, I think the people who are buying the NFT who are abusing the copyright, it's, it's other bad actors in the space. Yeah, and I think that's where it's still like early days, right? Like in terms of like, well, who's behind that wallet address, you know, the actual identity of the person behind the wallet address. And, and I know in, in certain countries, you actually need to know uh, in order for like the contract to be enforced. And so I think it's, again, it's just, it's, it's such early days. This, this is Jeanette, and, and I'm wondering too, in terms of this early days thinking, how much of this is really a publicity play at this point? You know, if, if you spend $500,000 for a piece of art, but you get a million dollars worth of PR out of it, then that's, you know, a good investment. And do we think that for artists, that that publicity piece is going to be a big component going forward? I'm done talking. I think it's the same, sort of the same thing as in the real world. I, I definitely think there's value in NFTs for sure. And that, it, you know, going forward, there will be what will be and how that will change, you know, remains to be seen. But just the fact that we have artists that have never been able to sell kind of in the, the traditional art space and now they can. And as we sort of move into the metaverse and as displays change, you know, there, there's value in it. But I mean... Same goes for artists, you know, just physical artists, right? When they sell their work, you know, I wouldn't call, you know, fine artists who sell their work for, you know, $50,000 for a print. Sure, it's great publicity for them and there's hype, but that doesn't mean that it's not, you know, worth that value, if that makes any sense. This, I think, happens in every market. This whole, let's use our marketing budget to inflate the value or at least bring more awareness. And, you know, if you look who bought the Beeple NFT and the people who were bidding on it, which I believe were, you know, Justin Tron and Medikovan, like they are both people who promote this ecosystem with their entire being. Like this was the biggest marketing coup of all time for NFTs because suddenly it was in every single paper on the planet. Like this was, you know, the best $69 million spent in marketing ever if you, you know, go to that end of it. 
so it was a really great investment, whether this is worth any money ever again or not. I mean, he was front page in every single newspaper on the planet. So there's a, there's a really big point there. Uh, plus it launched investment, plus it launched other communities. And now we have sort of settled down into this trough where real investment and real um, sort of creation and, and technology shift is happening maybe because of that influx. So it was worth it. I, I did want to comment on something Trish said too, which about the inappropriate use of the um, sort of scenario which you sold your NFT, right? You can just right click, save as, and print it. My company focuses a lot on anti-piracy. And so, you know, if you go watch a movie, you know, there's DVD copyrights and there's anti-piracy software that DVD players have implemented and there's watermarks on video screens. And this is all technology that has been put in place to either catch who stole it or to stop people from stealing it. But the only way any of that is ever useful is if every way you want to consume it enforces the rule set. And so, you know, if you think about something like Getty Images, you can buy an eight by 10 of Taylor Swift that you can print in a poster one time. Like th those are like the permutations and then you get a copy of it. And that's just a piece of paper. It's not like any, it's not like CVS would stop you from printing a poster. You could probably do it at Costco. But if your web browser checked your wallet for ownership before it displayed any image on a Google search result, that might be interesting. You, you couldn't play the game at all unless you owned the NFT for it in your wallet. It, you couldn't right click on anything unless you had a license to right click on it. Like that would be kind of interesting, right? Yeah, I, I ultimately kind of think it's going to play out like that where NFTs are going to be more helpful than harmful, but there's just always going to be issues. But that, that's kind of a killer idea. And we also, um, all of us here on this panel, uh, and many in the audience, as I see, also have uh, ties to film, television, music, and other entertainment ventures. And you know that NFTs are going to be very applicable to many different areas beyond, you know, the initial sort of headlines that we're seeing. Uh, with some album albums dropping, some you know major works of art being sold as NFTs or NFT, if you'd like. Um, what are you seeing? Um, maybe Rish, you have some thoughts here on the on the film, television, and or sort of moving picture side of the business. Yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, there's a you know a variety of possibilities in terms of uh, interactive content um, where you could you know, buy different endings um, to a piece of content or uh, be able to, 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 to buy uh, specific experiences um, that come along with that entertainment content, either physical or virtual. Um, so I think enhancing uh, linear content uh, to make it more interactive or to enhance interactive content with physical or virtual um you know, add-ons uh, is is a really awesome kind of way to kind of uh, you know make the content itself improved. And then on just on the on the marketing aspect of that too, um, you know, I think NFTs uh, could could give you know fans uh, different ways of accessing the content or being involved in the creation of the content. Um, uh, and, you know, adding in other technologies like AR, VR could also further enhance not only the, the viewing and experiencing of it, but also the, the marketing of it. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that we're thinking about in Superworld as it comes to um, doing that with uh, just film uh, or, uh, you know, other types of interactive content, too. Do you think that there are opportunities for uh, performance venues that are virtual spaces uh, where people could buy the rights to show certain kinds of content, either in their virtual business or their virtual house? Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, you know, I mean, on the uh, on on the virtual side, you know, I think there's 
you know, VR types of virtual experiences or AR types of virtual experiences. And, uh, you know, as, as we think about how those two different mediums uh, can be experienced virtually or in real life, um, I think that, that uh, there's, you know, other possibilities there. So again, if you don't have to be at the location or it could be a live you know, event that's happening where you can go into, uh, you can go and see something in VR by putting on a headset, or you could, um, you know, see AR content around you, or you're just not there physically and you're seeing both of those things. Um, and the NFT kind of plays a piece there as to what you have access to, or, you know, um, maybe something that you take home after the event or something like that. I think what also what Jeanette's working on, maybe I can I can talk a little bit about it. Jeanette, stop me if I say something wrong. No, uh, go ahead. She's working with festivals around the with, with film festivals around the country, and actually, um, Podelsky's working with her on this as well. And they provide this platform that allows the film festivals to show, uh, you know, uh, independent films digitally on you know on the big screen. But then also Kudelsky's Go Live platform, you know, provides them an outlet to go OTT. And I would venture to guess that this could be sort of merged with, uh, you know, Super World kind of uh, distribution as well, where you're having this third platform where they're actually doing the, the film festival in Super World. And it could be, you know, in Park City or it may be in some other place uh, for every single one of these festivals. Is that kind of where you're going, Jeanette? Yeah, that's exactly what I've been, th- what we've been thinking about and, and playing with so far. I think she's kind of asking you, Rish, if, you know, if you think of, you know, a few hundred film festivals that matter like Berlin and Sundance, et cetera, and the fact that you have this select group of work that's shown in, in all these festivals, uh, how would you envision tying these two platforms that they're developing, you know, one OTT and one digital cinema, if you'd like, into the VR, AR experience of Superworld? Yeah, so uh, again, I think the way that, one way of thinking about Superworld is it is a, you know, it is the internet of places, right? And so as if I'm sitting in my, you know, house and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, a film festival that's happening somewhere in the world that I uh, am not able to attend, uh, it, instead of going to a website, what we imagine is you can go to the map in Superworld and go to that location and so at that location, you know, you might in your world uh, or your company's world, Jeanette, have, uh, you know, ways for me to discover, you know, these films or content or, you know, any, anything that you want me to see or activate. And I could do that virtually uh, and or if I'm at the event, um, you know, again, I could look around me while I'm at the event and see the content that you've placed uh, that I can then, you know, click through and come to your website or whatever mode that you want me to activate that or buy a ticket or whatever. So, you know, I I think the concept is you can add this content or these links um, that lead to your content um, in physical locations that I can discover physically or virtually and experience also virtually. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So you really can go back and forth between the uh, physical world, the digital world in a traditional OTT sense, like, you know, watching it on your computer, et cetera, to actually being inside and outside of these mixed environments, uh, you know, with your experience, which, you know, one has to program all of that. I'm not sure how you guys will do it, but it sounds fascinating. Yep, we're not quite sure either. We're we're experimenting at this point, but um, I think that the pandemic has taught us that, you know, that in real life is great and digital is great, but there's still something missing and maybe virtual can help bridge that gap and maybe we can finally get some DRM 
that's connected to uh, blockchain in a way that's really sensible. Yeah, I love that idea with the guy, um, Rish, from, from the uh, Times Square, where he placed his actual digital art inside Times Square uh, with Superworld. And I thought that was really cool. I mean, that's an activation I've not seen, you know, before. And I feel that w- that would be fantastic for almost any venue or any live event kind of coordinating yeah, and that was that was just uh, you know I think a, a, a representation of utilizing the ability to place you know in that in that case a, a video file somewhere, and you know I think again w- w- we're expanding even beyond that to literally placing anything anywhere right so yeah so again uh, you could you could place the interactive three D you know, piece of content that you click on and then takes you to your OTT platform or, you know, a website link or whatever you want to do. Daniel, you were going to comment on this too. Yeah, I was going to mention like one one of the issues like with this like media rich content is that you need to save it somewhere and public blockchains are just very expensive to save information on. Even if you put in a distributed filing system like IPFS, if whoever issued that token stops paying, eventually that content's not going to be hosted and it's going to be a broken link. And, and that, is the, that is the biggest concern with all these NFTs. You can get as creative as you want and create like, uh, you know, royalty management systems and all that, you know, and that also brings up a bunch of other issues with, with securities regulation. But the main thing is that with all these NFTs, you are going to end up trusting some central party to either host the content or pay for the hosting of that content. And it just seems like everybody keeps ignoring that. And that is, that is the Achilles heel on, on this whole NFT industry. Excellent point. And I think Esther's kind of working on the solution for this and for even the token management in this way. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and that was one of the things that actually, um, for us, it was around, you know, like how you structure those legal terms. And like as a collector, how do you ensure, you know, th- you know, that point of failure that you're protected from that point of failure <clears throat> from a storage perspective? So I'm glad you brought that up. Ben, you had so, a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, so, so, I, so Esther, can, can you expand on that? Because then how, how is that addressed? Because if it's on IPFS or something, actually the only solution I can come up with is almost like creating a, uh, essentially a, a trust fund that pays for the hosting of these things forever and that just increases the, the cost of the NFT itself. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to how you're implementing a solution that addresses this, this issue. Yeah, um, so with that, I mean, it would just come down to like the lawyers in terms of the, how they think this could be creatively solved. But I think just being able to say, uh, you know, this NFT that you're purchasing um, is hosted here and this is how it's going to be, uh, you know, hosted for the life of the NFT, like something along those lines. But how they would structure that, you know, obviously just sort of comes down to um, the issuer. Actually, that brings up an idea that like when, when you mentioned the life of the NFT, life has to be defined in, in a finite way. So perhaps it's something where like the issuer uh, says that they're going to host the end, they're going to pay the cost for the next 10 years or something. And afterwards, if they don't, if they don't keep paying, or if in the meantime, the company goes bankrupt, then there's got to be a way in which the file is made available. It should be held in escrow. And then it, it makes it it's made available to the owner of the NFT who would then have the right to remint that NFT somewhere else. And essentially the old NFT becomes a pointer to the new one. That exactly. could probably be a, a work around it. it. Exactly. Yeah, there's you can get really creative here. Um, but you know, that would be, you know, one example. Ben, you had a quick question. Hi, yeah, no, thank you for uh, this interesting conversation. And hi Esther. Uh, Daniel, I think you raised something really interesting and important about NFTs in general. Um, I have this concept of what I call an entropic NFT which honors the fact that uh, bits do fall apart and things do need to exist um, in some sort of sense of time, in sense of, of life cycle. And I think if you look at the way that people pay for cemetery plots, you can get an, an inspiration for how you would be able to do a long-lived uh, trust fund or something like that to effectively pay for, you can think of it like an Amazon Web Services 
bill in order to maintain the hard drive and the electricity and the C minimal CPU for some particular digital asset. And uh, I think we will see fun things like that uh, that will cause uh, people to live, uh, uh, NFTs to live longer. Uh, one, I, I work on this project called IR um, that has as part of one of the add-on things the idea of a backup for NFTs. Uh, I, and I think you're right that most people don't actually know that these things have a finite uh, implied life. And again, uh, one of the things I want to be able to build is what I call an entropic NFT, which honors that sort of failure uh, that, that happens. But would love to catch up with you separately on something like that. I, I couldn't find any uh, way to DM you in your profile. I'm Ben Wen on Twitter, if you want to find me there. I have a weird uh, Instagram account so uh, for my uh, candying uh, side business. But uh, well, I'd love to connect with you. So, Xavier, you want to introduce yourself? Xavier was one of our presenters in the virtual and film salon, is one of the most interesting investors in our space. You want to tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Xavier Segura, uh, and I am one of the general partners at uh, Morgan Creek uh, Capital Management um, on their uh, on their on their Morgan Creek digital side, so the the venture wing. And so we we invest in early and growth stage blockchain intelligence companies. So kind of the the, the marriage between blockchain and, and AI. And sort of uh, prior to Morgan Creek life, I was a founder and managing partner at Tessera Venture Partners, also investing in early stage uh, blockchain. And kind of prior to that, I spent uh, 12 years uh, working for large uh, tech companies like uh, Oracle and Verizon and AT&T within uh, product development and business development. So uh, definitely looking forward to kind of continuing the conversation here and, and, and learning from you all. And you had some really interesting points about investments in NFTs at the very tail end of our sure. salon. Day. So maybe you can just kind of reframe them here for this discussion because I thought they were so so invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just kind of getting at um from from that point that I think that NFTs uh, in in sort of the the pure sense really help to democratize a new asset class. Um, so I kind of look at things from from an institutional investment standpoint. That's that's who our uh, main constituents are where we're trying to kind of go into emerging technologies and, and emerging data uh, revolutions uh, to uh, ultimately create enterprise value. So if I look at an NFT, I look at a really unique way and a new way to be able to own fractional ownership within previously an unattainable asset. And the first thing that I think of that comes to my mind, I know it might be a little bit trite or simple, with some of the use cases that we we we, we can see, is uh, investing, and specifically in managed portfolios. Uh, a few years ago, you were unable to get anybody on the phone if you had investments under a million bucks, liquid. And if you had in the single millions, you'd probably get a cookie cutter portfolio that you know, basically just constituted in you investing in index funds and maybe a little bit of bonds. And look to where we've we've come today. I mean, look at what the robo advisors are are capable of doing uh, with companies like Wealthfront and, and Betterment, um, to name a few. Uh, and even to the extent that those themselves have become commoditized, and they're now been offered by the legacy players like Goldman Sachs with Marcus or uh, mergers of um, Morgan Stanley and, and E Trade, which which kind of gear towards um, new new types of financial products. So NFT for me uh, kind of speaks, speaks to that lens of, well, previously I couldn't own something like a Picasso and I can't cut it up into a million pieces or I can't cut up a, you know, a, a classic Porsche Le Mans car into, a, into itty bitty pieces. And I might not have been able to afford the big ticket item. So I look at it as a, as a really unique way, as long as it is based in a physical asset uh, to, to provide a, a sort of a unique storage of value. Uh, and it is certainly one that I can tell you that that institutionals are are taking a look at today. So, in terms of the um, ability to invest your money in you know multitude of assets today uh, that was only available to you know high net worth investors, accredited investors in the past, and and on a limited basis, you know especially if it was a liquid type of investment. Um, if you look at um, you know companies that are trying to um, 
provide access to these tokens like you know coinbase one of your investment blockfi etc um what do you think will happen would there be any tokenized funds that consumers will be able to invest in like a venture fund that you can actually purchase pieces of i know there's some in switzerland but i don't know what the you know timeline is for the us maybe yeah absolutely i think that's going to be the na- the next uh, wave of um of, of, of enhancements there because at, at first sort of the, the protocol has to exist. So actually even before the protocol, the need has to exist. So there's never going to be a shortage of, of needs for number one, having a hedge towards, uh, towards inflation and or, um, and or recession. Uh, right. And I think that's one of the things that, that I thought was pretty interesting when we did an analysis was that, that Bitcoin uh, or even gold for that matter was Bitcoin is supposed to replace in some ways, the storage of value of gold is not necessarily correlated uh, with with financial downturns, as as you would expect it to be as a hedge. So basically, when stocks go down, you know, gold should go up or Bitcoin should go up. It doesn't always do that. Um, so it's not a perfectly hedged instrument. But I think things like fine art uh, and potentially classic automobiles or other very uh, scarce luxury items. That, that couldn't be divided, uh, really, really provide that access. So that's kind of the broad drop is sort of like, is there a market need and is there a product to suit that market need? Well, yes and yes. And as far as sort of the, the availability of those assets, um, they, will, they will exist sort of independently uh, of, of any sort of holding. So that's why you can kind of, you know, purchase them in sort of these exchange-based environments. I would also caution, you know, that just because something claims to be, you know, a one-of-one uh, Monet, I would I would be careful. I still think that you know, kind of part of the prior conversations we had on on regulation and, and regulation in general when it comes to crypto and investing, I think that that is a great place where the two can sort of meet uh, to provide at least some level of custody, so that we can we can authenticate this to an extent. That's what the that's what an exchange is there for, right? To provide some element of custody, some element of anti fraud, and and some level of um, some level of compliance. So as far as the, on the funding side, um, you know, it's, it's sort of occurring now based on investments within protocols. So sort of protocols that are able to, uh, to sort of support, um, this, uh, this tokenization number one. And I think also there's, there's overall investment within, um, you know, the custody providers. So I don't think that that will, that will stop. And then of course, you know, what we, you know, to kind of point out, one of my own investments uh, through uh, through Morgan Creek, uh, BlockFi. You know what what they aim to do is to be uh, sort of the first crypto bank. Um, and so, you know, what does that even mean? You have a lot of money sitting around in in wallets, and mostly that's institutional money. So that's not going anywhere, uh, and it's mostly collecting dust while they ride out the volatilities of tweets or or various other um, you know exogenous forces to the market. Uh, as it sort of slowly transforms in in in, in the new digital uh, evolution, so in order to generate interest, right now, uh, you know they're they're doing things like loans and lending, like conventional banks. But tomorrow, that will look like investment in other assets and other digital assets. So absolutely, uh, NFT is is one of those such assets where I could I could probably point to as 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 a as a very near-term opportunity for both investors and also for uh, exchanges as well as um, participants and, and funds uh, in in those areas, and will they actually buy assets themselves? I don't. I don't see why not. I think it's it's probably a better better bet. We always tend to invest in the picks and shovels, uh, but if you can get access to the to the actual gold mine itself, and you know you have conviction on that, sure, I would. I would wouldn't hesitate there either i would i I would caution against um investing in you know tokenized art and classic cars and that kind of things with the intention of it being a more stable store of value uh even if we look at something like gold and real estate the reason why they are so you know potentially a good store of value is because they're not volatile um in terms of gold, I mean, gold is probably kind of like the only like decent store of value left 
if you think about real estate, people think that real estate is really good because it's not volatile. Real estate is not volatile because it, at, in a best case scenario, uh, real estate properties are valued, you know, every few years. And even when you have a fund that has several properties, that valuation is on like every quarter. If you look at the REITs, REITs, which are the Real Estate Investment Trust, they're actually are, are strongly correlated with equities. Their correlation with equities is higher than that of the correlation with the real estate market. So if now we're going to grab a bunch of assets and tokenize them, whether they're like art uh, collectibles like and all those type of things, as long as they are considered uh, a, an asset of speculation, and as long as we actually create rails that allow the trading to be more frequent, then these are going to be highly volatile instruments. And, and risky assets, risky means it's high volatility. And when the market goes down and there's a risk of uh, sentiment, all those high volatility assets will sell. Whether that is, you know, like classic cars held by people that invest in, for example, Rally Road. It's a company that tokenizes classic cars, since you brought up that example. Right. If you have a bunch of hipsters that invested in cars in Rally Road and the economic situation gets bad, most likely those hipsters will have to, to liquidate those shares to pay rent or something like that. I'm saying like anything that is liquid has the a higher potential to be volatile. So yes, ideally that I, I, th I would like an ideal scenario in which tokenized art and other types of thing actually become good stores of value, but I'm highly skeptical because I think the, the added liquidity may actually work against that. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. And I think that you know, when you look at volatility, it's it's really interesting to see how correlated a lot of assets are. Uh, gold, for that matter, is, is also pretty highly volatile. It's actually, it wasn't until about the dot-com crisis where it actually started to escalate in value and sort of the way that we see it now is sort of, you know, over $2,000 an ounce. So it's almost directly correlated with um, with inflation, but but not in the way that we may expect. So I think when it comes to uh volatility in assets one of the things that that we should probably talk about and i don't have the answer for this is exactly how many fractional shares of a particular good or object is the correct one because ultimately what's what makes what drives uh price tends to be sometimes artificial scarcity like you know think about an iphone or think about you know fine art in terms of you know which which art is is the one that's deemed to be collectible but I think it, it still provides a, a pretty counter measure towards, towards inflation, just because these things tend to, just given that they're not, there's not as many, you know, of, of, of some of these objects, it will inherently create an implicit value. But I think your point is a good one where you have to sort of monitor the amount of accessibility in trading, which might be orthogonal to the, to the whole point about, you know, democratizing the underlying access to these markets because before if you didn't have you know minimum net worth of x you weren't even allowed to raise a paddle at sotheby's to bid on you know whatever the item is that that will be tokenized but in the end let's also be clear those auction houses are looking for liquidity themselves so i think that there will be a natural corollary and it's possible that the entire asset may not be tokenized right you may be able to tokenize i know it's kind of crazy but you might be able to tokenize, let's say, half of a collection or or partial ownerships, like maybe, you know, dividing that into a smaller number of, of hands. But I would say that I would I would push back and say that that these that these objects, at least from an institutional standpoint, may may absorb a daytime speculator that that might be in it for the for the short term, just because in the end, there's a finite number of the assets, assuming that you divide them, you know, in a in a way which uh, would not create an infinite number of, of subdivisions. Yeah, I think one thing I uh, this points out is, you know, like in the regular stock market, we've you know, got a hundred years or so of history to build a set of rules where you know we know when to stop up and stop down, and we know when robotic trading happens, and we know what front trading is. And in this particular scenario, we have figured out how to make it work. We have, we're working on where to make it work. We're not quite sure about how to make it work safe yet because we don't know what the bounds are. And when everything is 100% digital without the human in there, uh, a complex system goes quite awry when it scales around the world. And 
I, I think there's going to need to be a lot of technical people who study rules and permutations and economics and game theory. You know, I can't really stress enough how modeling a system when it's boy, almost chaos theory, like, like these markets, it's really hard. And unless you actually see something go down 80% and then correct 80% 10 minutes later, you're like, wow, should that be allowed to happen? Like, is that what free market really is? Um, so I, I think as we get more examples, as this industry gets bigger, as investment goes up and down, we'll know whether or not these sort of big funds could absorb that or if their robotic trading system will you know start shorting it on the way down so they can catch it back on the way up because that's how they've traditionally learned to react right are they going to apply those rules to this new market and it'll be fine or are they going to apply no rules to the new market and wait a while that, that's what's interesting to me from a maybe a fraud perspective and a, a safety perspective Incredibly important, Scott, to talk about. You know, I'm going to keep my uh, my thoughts about gold being the safe haven right now, the best place to keep your money. But that being said, um, cybersecurity is a major problem. I think we're all aware that the stock market is definitely being run by algos as well as AI. Um, the AI is obviously getting much more aggressive on certain stocks, um, and this can easily be proven. So blockchain is obviously a huge solution for this. Uh, my personal interest, though, I just wanted to bring up was a really hot topic. AI is now able to be run in real time. So I was wondering if there's any NFTs that are currently considering or how holograms are gonna impact that specific aspect of the holograms uh, moving forward since that industry is about to become much more explosive. So I think a comment I have there is if you, you know, I don't know of anybody actively doing this, but if you look at the, design of a crypto kitty right a crypto kitty is a definition of what the display should look like when you put it all together and i would imagine that in in terms of an ai when you maybe own the nft of what a model is to create the output of what that learned ai model does we're going to start to see things you know you own the dynamic creation under this scenario as learned from that scenario um so it's like a live world, but maybe you own a time slice or maybe you own a derivation. And I think as we start to maybe display a hologram that's based on somebody, you know, because it was learned from somewhere, it's not a hundred percent fake. I, I think we'll end up with then rights that go from that. Um, I know we, we've talked about these uh, uh, dynamic fake movie celebrities that get inserted into movies now after their passing and, like that's their image and their voice. We talked about this an hour ago. It, is it okay to use AI to generate their voice if their voice comes from a pattern? Is, is that an AI thing or is that a their mm -hmm. thing? You know. I would no, say that. Point. I would say that on the in, on the in, some of the investments that we've been seeing, and these are these are great topics. I'm really liking the dialogue. Uh, is in computer vision. So kind of to kind of pull the thread on. You know what's a what's a direct use case of of AI in in NFT and and more broadly within security uh, within any sort of blockchain protocol and and should there be a human layer uh, mandated you know in in any sort of exchange based environment um, you know obviously if we're, if we're talking about fine art or other things so when you when you kind of have in the real world you have a set of experts who you kind of trust to verify something to be to be legitimate or to be true um, and Potentially, if you're setting up an exchange, you're setting up a bunch of NFTs and a sort of, you know, Monet co collection, you know, should you still have that? Should you still have an arbiter to sort of say, you know, these these are all legitimate um, or I think, you know, what what we have started to see. And this is this is for the somewhat, I would say, less valuable um, objects, because I I still think and maybe I'm just old school here. Behavioral finance is a real thing, and at the end of the day, you know, one of the one of the things that's also kind of uh, absent from a lot of the AI that we see within algorithmic trading is is how human beings would really react to a panic. You know, would they really start shorting uh, different different goods that um, that might actually be useful, like you know, things like uh, 
things like hospitals that would just kind of potentially go go under in a in a in a loss of a power grid. But that aside, computer vision in in actual goods within sort of you know blockchain based environments is is happening today. Uh, we we start seeing that with sort of some basic things um, from like autograph memo, memorabilia, which is a is easier for a computer to verify. Like for example, if you see you know, a baseball car that's been signed by a famous player. It's it's much, much easier to sort of verify that today. That's a little less sophisticated out of an AI. And in fact, some of the big institutions are already doing that. I think kind of the, the magic is that it can happen at inception. So while you load up, let's say you're good. I mean, imagine if eBay had this today to be able to verify this on their end, uh, but then sort of run the transactions uh, on, on the blockchain. So it'd be a nice sort of marriage between the two. That's a great point, as well as um, I literally just sat for over three hours uh, one day and still was not able to get access to MBA um, top shot. Basically, they're doing limited edition um, different NFTs for basketball players. Um, so I'm assuming sometimes in the future, you know, this will eventually evolve into holographs. So really interesting. You and Scott have a tough time purchasing these top shot. <laughs> um, I think part of the problem that we're seeing here is also consumers um, ability, like all of you, everyone on this panel today is very experienced in the space. Um, you've purchased a variety of things, um, including NFTs. But the most interesting thing is that we still have trouble getting things that we want from the marketplaces. When do you guys think the consumers are actually going to have an easy way to transact in this space? You know, I, I realize I'm a big, you know, Coinbase user and BlockFi user, and I, I love several exchanges. I feel they've done, you know, wonderful things in, in this last few years in terms of making it easy to use. But the NFT marketplaces are not that easy to use. So what, when do you think this will happen? I think you have to define easy. So there's one marketplace where you can just put in your Visa card and it gets bought. So that's kind of easy. Um, if you turn on NFTs in, I don't know, World of Warcraft or whatever, Ubisoft or Blizzard game suddenly says, hey, your sword is an NFT and you click buy and it spends in-game currency. Well, that I think is what you really mean when it's easy. The thing behind the curtains is called an NFT and it might be, a, you know, on a, a ledger, the Ubisoft ledger or something. That's kind of cheating when we define it how we do today. Um, it's tricky because people haven't figured out if this stuff is property yet. Can, can you buy it with a dollar bill if it's on a chain with a token? Well, you can't because you have to convert the dollar bill to a foreign currency of the country of that chain and transact in that currency and then value it back in the original currency. Like we haven't quite figured that out yet. And we have to figure that out before it's easy because easy means Visa, MasterCard, Apple Pay, in-game coins. And I think we got to resolve what this stuff is in my opinion. Absolutely. Spoken like a true marketer. <laughs> I, like I would it. say that's a great, that's a great point. And I would also say there, I don't, I don't know if, if um, there is necessarily agreed upon standard about what, what that underlying protocol should be. You know, should the same protocol exist within art as within cards as within collectibles um, that might also affect sort of what you might, ex what you might require from the AI? Absolutely. I think we um, we have run out our time. We try to keep these within an hour. I love the discussion and everyone's contribution today, so I kept it a little longer. Uh, please join us again next week from 1.30 to 2.30. We're discussing ways to earn revenue, launch ventures with NFTs, DeFi, and consensus blockchain economies. Uh, we have a very experienced panel here of technologists, marketers, 
um, CEOs, investors um, in the space. And I appreciate all of your input today and participation. And thank you very much for joining us for this um, Infium uh, Clubhouse discussion. See you all, guys. See you next week. Thanks. See you later. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great talk. Thank you. Bye.